Hi, Brockton residents. This is Mayor Robert Sullivan, and it's my honor and privilege to serve as your mayor. And of course, right now, we're still dealing with COVID-19, uh, the deadly virus that has uh, taken 256 lives in the city. And we're working diligently on, a, on a, the health uh, initiatives, but also, as we know, uh, here in the, in the city, in the Commonwealth, and in the nation, there's real positive change right now for uh, racial justice. Uh, long overdue uh, systemic change is needed. Uh, we all witnessed the brutal murder of George Floyd. Um, and when George Floyd's murders were charged on Friday, Saturday morning, I called Police Chief Manny Gomes to meet me at City Hall at 45 School Street. And without hesitation, the chief was there. And I, I did my first press conference. And then the following Monday, we had a prayer vigil at City Hall. I got up there and spoke, and, uh, and Chief Gomes spoke from the heart as well. Um, so I, uh, I just wanted to come before you today. I'm proud to say that Chief Manny Gomes is here as well. We're going to answer some questions. We're going to go over some practice and procedures. Um, you know, we have been working diligently um, together, uh, the chief and, and the mayor's office, with community activists. Uh, the chief doesn't hesitate to get on Zooms with myself and community activists. Uh, chief and I attended a, a wonderful outdoor um, justice rally uh, at New Heights Charter School. Uh, and we stayed and we answered the questions and that's why you know we we serve we serve the public and i want to thank the city council because uh chief manny gomes is is a good man he's a great leader of the brockton police department and i agreed to appoint him to three years and the city council uh, unanimously approved that just recently so uh chief is going to be working hand in hand with me during my time as mayor uh, but one thing is that listen i'll be honest i'm a white mayor a white 50 year old in a city that is a minority majority community uh, my friends that are black or a minority or people of color have had uh, fears that I've never felt, discrimination and bigotry that I've never had. Uh, but I, uh, I acknowledge that and I'm um, saying right now to be a good leader, you have to be a good listener. And uh, I listen to uh, the citizens and we're going to continue to work together. The key word is working together, collaboration. Um, you know, talk is cheap, we have to act. And one thing that I can say that I've done since I've been mayor is I've been really um, acting in a positive manner for all in Brockton, right? It's an inclusive community, and we know that Brockton can really be an example, not just for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, but for the nation as a whole. And, uh, and one key component of that is to have uh, Chief Manny Gomes uh, work with me uh, hand in hand. And one thing the chief has done, which I think is unbelievable and brilliant, is um, he's appeared before the city council, He's interacting with the elected officials and the citizens, and that's what it means to be a public servant. Now, we're just different in terms of he serves from a law enforcement, I serve from a government standpoint, but at the end of the day, the synergy is there. But we need to listen uh, to the constituents, the residents, the taxpayers, the people that are gonna help us as we build the building blocks for success. And I mean that, and we will do that as long as the mayor of the city of Brockton. So a couple of things I just want to share with you uh, before the chief answers some questions uh, that I'll ask him as well is um, President Obama, former President uh, Barack Obama, uh, has created a mayor's pledge. Uh, it's with my Brothers Keeper Alliance, and I proudly uh, took that pledge as mayor of the city of Brockton. I sat down with the chief and we went over the Obama pledge, my Brothers Keeper Alliance, and uh, I formally uh, signed that and uh, I, we're gonna adhere to it. And um, one of these things uh, that I wanted to just share with you is that um, the four components of the pledge is review, police use of form, force policies, engage communities by including a diverse range of input, experiences, and stories. Number three is report the findings of the Obama Foundation and seek feedback. And number four is reform police use of force policies. And one thing I can tell you about Chief Gomes, this is his second tenure as chief. He served under former Mayor Linda Belzotti, uh, and he'll be able to talk to you about in 2013, Brockton Police enacted under his leadership um, current policies right now. So um, this is gonna be an informative session. Um, we're gonna have many of these. I know the chief just volunteered and agreed to go on an NAACP forum again. Uh, and that's what it's all about, you know, working together to to make sure that people feel that change is coming uh, and the change is enacted in a proper manner. Um, one thing I also wanted to let you know is that um, there's a policy right now nationwide called Eight Can't Wait, and we're gonna go through the eight steps, uh, and the chief is gonna be able to give you information on that. But first of all, chief, thank you. Thank you for your service to the city of Brockton. Thank you, Mr. This Mr. is part two. You were under uh, Linda Belzotti, and yes. now you're under myself, and I'm proud to have you aboard. One thing I can say, Manny, is you know, you're a product of the Brockton Public Schools. 
You immigrated here as a child to the yes. city of Brockton. Um, how long have you been on the force now, Chief? I'm in my 35th year. Congratulations. 35 years in the city of Brockton Police Department. And uh, we won't talk about that one year on the fire department, right? That's but right. Uh, but um, one thing that um, you know we have discussed many times in private and with citizens on Zooms, and it runs the gamut uh, on you know what people are saying. And when I took office before COVID, uh, you and I went to Messiah Baptist. We were invited to go uh, to talk to members of the NAACP and citizens. Um, and we took some criticisms and some suggestions and some ideas. But what I can say is at the end of the day, you gave your card out, you followed up with everybody, mm -hmm. and I've heard nothing but positive reviews on the interaction. So we'll just continue to do that, Chief. Um, one thing I was hoping you could do, um, Chief, is talk about Brockton Police demographics. Uh, it, it's a diverse force. Uh, of course, civil service prevails a lot. Yes. Um, but under your leaderships, what are some of the statistics that we could inform the general public about? Well, the Brockton Police Department, um, as I tell people, uh, it's a reflection of Brockton. And what I'm happy to say about Brockton Police Department is that they're really Brockton high class of one year or another. A lot of, uh, when I say a lot, I mean just about a major, entire department is a Brockton high class of one year or another. We do have some Spelman kids, but <laughs> but they are they are uh, Brockton, and they what the Brockton Police Department has done is um, again with some restrictions through civil service is uh, we've made the uh, the department uh, look like its community that it serves, uh, both in specialized positions uh, such as detectives, any other specialized positions, and now I'm happy to say that uh, it's coming along through the rank structure of the police department. As you know, Mr. Mayor, just um, you know, within a few weeks, we, we named our first Hispanic female That's to right. the rank of lieutenant. Historic. First time ever. That's right. Historic. historic. And she's wonderful. She's wonderful. Right. And, and right now, I'm happy to say the Brockton Police Department, I think it's the most diverse police department in a commonwealth with 37% with, uh, um, uh, minority um, officers. And now, again, like I said, we're, we're starting to see advancements into the rank structure which will change it even more. Excellent. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, uh, what you said is the, the Brockton roots are there, right? Yes. It doesn't matter if you grew up on the east side, south side, north side, west side, Campello, Montello, the village, <clears throat> it's Brockton. Um, you know, some people um, have been calling for a defunding, defunding. And what I will say about that is as follows. We're in uncharted territories right now financially because of this deadly virus known as COVID. Um, you know, Brockton uh, is in dire consequences financially. One thing that Chief Gomes did and Chief Williams from the fire department is they sat down with me before we planned the actual budget. Chief Gomes, to his credit, right off the bat, we were able to shave $500,000, a half a million dollars from salaries and overtime uh, through mechanisms and procedures that the chief has implemented to save money, fiscal responsibility, cost containment measures. So half a million bucks has already been, uh, you know, uh, taken away from the police. Uh, and I know the city council um, took, took a vote, 200,000 from overtime. Um, but I do know this, that we need to make sure that the state gives us our chapter 70 funds. Uh, that's the state aid that comes to the localities. Brockton relies very, very heavily on that. Over 80% of our school funding is from the state. And right now we don't have the hard numbers. So I wanna thank the city council again and the school committee. School committee passed a budget. It was ratified um, by the city council, nine to two vote. Uh, but Chief Gomes, to his credit, has been working diligently um, within the financial means that we have right now. So, you know, we're working um, uh, best practices to move forward. Um, and one best practice that I wanted the Chief to share with you is the policy that's in place right now. Uh, it's, it's a document that the Chief has given out freely. Um, my office created a health equity task force to deal with COVID and deal with uh, ethnic disparities and data. Um, we PDF this to those. It's not a hidden document. It's a, it's, it's, it's a breathing, living document that the chief was helped, uh, helped to author. Chief, could you, could you give some of the uh, general public some information? Because a lot of people don't know about this. You know, you hear ban the chokehold. Brockton hasn't had that in decades. Correct, correct. Uh, Brockton officers, um, our rules and regulations specifically outline the measures that they can take and the tools that they can use. If it's not in our rules and regulations, which is similar to other police uh, procedures, they cannot use it, they cannot do that. Uh, as far as chokeholds, uh, in my entire career, it's, it's, it hasn't been taught. Uh, it's not in our rules and regulations. They're not taught. 
officers would be uh, well outside to do any of that, uh, possibly be removed from service. Uh, that is not anywhere in line with, with our training. Our rules and regulations specifically itemize uh, the tools that they can use. And what goes along with um, some of these uh, measures is that officers have to uh, write a written report of any tool that they used prior to uh, securing for that day. It has to be done immediately. And there's also full reporting uh, by a supervisor and the officer of any injury to anyone we've come in contact. So um, we, we create these written reports at the end of the day <clears throat> to buttress our rules and regulations. Um, but our rules and regulations are based on an escalation and de-escalation, um, balance approach to the type of resistance that we receive, and uh, clearly outlines the cessation of that force once the resistance has changed. Um, and the balanced approach uh, is also uh, in line with constant verbal commands throughout our rules and regulations, whether it's lethal, less than lethal, or just passive resistance, uh, mandates that every part of our force system requires uh, verbal commands uh, to, deal, to deal with some of the... Uh, the verbal commands are a huge component of de-escalation. So if we can de-escalate by, by, by verbal commands, uh, we'll do that. And <clears throat> along with that, uh, Massachusetts, as I've stated before, Massachusetts, uh, the training is at a much higher level than it is in other states. Um, when it comes to police training, sadly, um, we're 50 different countries. Mm -hmm. What's allowed in Massachusetts or what the standards are in Massachusetts will vary from state to state. Um, Massachusetts, the bar is pretty high. Um, and there's some legislation coming out that we obviously uh, not only support, but we will adhere to immediately. Mm -hmm. um, so there's already been a component of um, less lethal, um, especially dealing with mental health issues. Um, so there, there are, there's a lot extra training that goes into de-escalation that's um, it's mandated by the state. The Brockton PD, we send all of our officers to a one weekend service, which talks about de-escalation and all that um, in its mandated training. We also send our department right now, um, it's relatively new within the last year or so, but we've already sent 75 of our uniformed officers to an additional, uh, at, at extra cost, it's not put on by the state, additional de-escalation uh, and we've seen and we've seen some good things come from that. We've had, we've had officers involved in um, what would be, uh, they would probably would have been justified in using lethal force, mm -hmm. and they didn't have to do that. And, and it's based on the fact that police departments that train more have less incidents, mm. okay? The, the officers have greater confidence. They're able to take uh, command of a situation much greater. Um, so we, we have seen here uh, that that investment has is, is had less severe incidents. That's excellent. That's excellent. I mean, um, the brave men and women, you know, I'm very thankful for the brave men and women on Brockton PD, uh, put their lives on the line to, to save lives and make our community safe. I know people are in an uproar right now with fireworks, but we have more cruisers out there. We're working diligently. It's not unique to Brockton. It's happening everywhere right now. Um, but in terms of real change, uh, beneficial change, uh, to help uh, the community as a whole. Um, this these, uh, policy, it's called Eight Can't Wait. Um, and number one, um, there's eight steps. Number one is ban chokeholds and strangleholds. Allowing officers to choke or strangle civilians result in the unnecessary death or serious injury of civilians. Both chokeholds and other ne neck restraints must be banned in all cases. You've already said, Chief, it hasn't been used. You've been on 35 years. Yes. Hasn't been happening. No, it's, uh, it's not a policy. Right. Um, you also mentioned, I think it's important to reiterate it again, when there's an arrest made, when someone's brought to the station for booking, um, a, a brass, a supervisor will inspect uh, if any damages were inflicted in any way, any way. If someone hit their head uh, or fell down uh, or anything, um, it isn't the arresting officer that, it's the supervisor that will come and inspect it. Yes. Okay. And that okay. requires a written report. Written report. Okay. Okay. All right. Great. So number one is already met. Number two, require de-escalation. 
Require office to de-escalate situations where possible by, by communicating with subjects, maintaining distance, and otherwise eliminating the need to use force. Yes. That, that, as I mentioned earlier, we, we uh, set up extra training. The state, the state Training Council has already put it in their program, which I think is advanced, uh, much more advanced than other places in the country. But we've done that and additional training. And with verbal commands and the way our rules and regulations specifically use the word that force has to be balanced by the threat that's made at the officer. Okay. Okay. And it must, uh, it requires de-escalating immediately uh, once there's compliance. Okay. So that's already met as well. Yes. Number three, require warning before shooting. Require officers to give a verbal warning in all situations before using deadly force. Correct. And then I talked about those verbal commands. Officers are trained in that, that it's consistent. Um, and we also, our, um, our, our uh, level of force, especially when it gets into discharging your firearms, uh, that has to be an absolute last resort. We cannot use our firearms to uh, shoot at moving vehicles, uh, warning shots, or, or use that weapon in any way other than for that ultimate threat of, of, of possible death to you or, or an innocent victim. So the only way that a police officer would fire at a moving vehicle if that vehicle was being used as a weapon to either maim or injure the police officer, like a yeah. deadly force, yes. like driving towards, towards a police officer. Yes. Okay, number four, require, requires exhaust all alternatives before shooting. Require officers to exhaust all alternatives, including non-force and less lethal force options, prior to resorting to deadly force. Correct, and our rules and regulations talk about the escalation of the threat in our force, also the de-escalation. Um, but we clearly outline that uh, lethal force is an absolute last resort. Okay. Everything, any other tool has to be uh, exhausted at that point uh, to rise to that level. Okay. The fifth under the eight can't wait. Number five, duty to intervene. Requires officers to intervene and stop excessive force used by other officers and report these incidents immediately to a supervisor. Yes. We, we have our officers are mandated to report uh, all of those things prior to the end of their tour of duty, uh, and all the reports have to be finished. And, and as far as intervening, um, we've also had cases here in Brockton. We, we've had a case where an officer, an, a ranking officer, was was disciplined and discharged from service uh, by by officers who intervened and spoke against him. Okay. So we we already have these things in place. Officers also know that uh, silence. Silence is culpable by joint venture. If you don't speak, you're part of the problem right. and, you're, and you're part of the conspiracy to cover it up. That's right, and, and we've seen this on t-shirts, right? Silence is equals consent. Yes. Okay, number six is ban shooting at moving vehicles. We already talked about it. But bans officers from shooting at moving vehicles in all cases which is regarded as a particularly dangerous and ineffective tactic. While some departments may restrict the shooting of vehicles to particular situations, these loopholes allow for police to continue killing in situations that are too common. 62 people were killed by police last year in these situations. Um, this must be banned. You've already expressed it, it's not on the books unless it was last dire resort where they were using the vehicle to try to kill or maim the police officer. Correct, we, it's very clear that we do not shoot at fleeing vehicles or, or a vehicle that's not posing a threat to anyone. Uh, but it, it's uh, just shooting at fleeing vehicles is uh, absolutely prohibited. Okay. Number seven, require use of force continuum. Establish a force continuum that restricts the most severe types of force to the most extreme situations and creates clear policy restrictions on the use of each police weapon and tactic. And I, I I mean, I've read this document and, and we'll be happy to give it out to other citizens as well, but you've right. already addressed um, the use of force right. through well, the policy. The, our rules and regulations are, are parallel to what the state set out. We actually expanded on that. Um, when these uh, rules and regulations were enacted just a few years ago, um, it's all about verbal commands and the, the, the force used by the police has to be balanced to the threat that's made. Our rules and regulations even outline the type of resistance that you're facing, whether it's passive resistance or someone's actually being combative uh, or if someone has, has a weapon uh, other than a firearm um, 
whether they're armed or not. So it's all about it's all about a balanced approach. And our rules and regulations specifically outline that the once the threat is under control, that de-escalation has to be part of that. Okay, great. And the last uh, number eight under E can't wait is require comprehensive reporting. Requires officers to report each time they use force or threaten to use force against civilians. Comprehensive reporting includes requiring officers to report whenever they point the fi firearm at someone in addition to all other types of force. Correct. Uh, we, we have, we expand that, that an, when an officer uh, has to use his baton, if an officer has to use pepper spray or a taser, yes. which are less than lethal, um, even our canine dogs, every time, every time that they use for some kind of police service or they end up finding a suspect, um, that has to be documented every time the dog is used. The dog is, is considered a police tool. Uh, whenever any of these items are used by an officer, whether they inflicted injury or not, they must report by the end of that day uh, that those weapons came out and were used. Okay, okay. I mean, I, I just want to thank you, first of all, for what you do, Chief. Um, the eight can't wait. We've already met those standards. Yes. Um, where, as mayor, I'm going to um, publicly, um, you know, put that up uh, on social media as well. Um, the chief and I are always ready, willing, and able to, to talk to any citizens, uh, any community activists. Um, right now, uh, one of the other things that I'm in the process of, of, uh, of establishing is a community justice task force. I'm in the process of, um, of vetting out certain citizens here, residents that want to participate. Um, we're going to have, you know, a really great dialogue, open conversation. Um, I've already had two commitments from people. I'm not going to publicly announce the names until we get the full task force joined. Uh, but we're going to be working, you know, an advisory standpoint to get all the information out, put everything on the table, uh, and then the chief will be there as well to help us. And, and again, we just got to work together. And um, you know what I have said um, that I, I'm, you know, I'm proud to be the mayor of Brockton. You know, and we're dealing with a lot right now. I do want to say again, the evening of June 2nd was not the Brockton that I know. Uh, violence and vandalism is never going to create the change that we all want. It only hampers the effort. It doesn't help the effort. Um, I want to applaud the chief and all the members of Brockton police, uh, as well as state police, uh, sheriff's offices, uh, National Guard that helped that evening. Um, and we're going to continue to work in a positive, peaceful manner. Um, to create the change that everybody uh, is desiring and, and much needed. So, Chief, is there anything that you wanted to uh, summarize before we conclude? I, I just uh, want to, uh, again, reemphasize the fact that there is a bill before the legislature. And um, our rules and regulations are a living document. And whatever the state passes, we'll, we'll enact it. Um, they're actually seeking for us to be consistent so the wording is the exact. Um, but I, I can assure you that uh, once it's passed, we will uh, incorporate into our rules and regs that day. Excellent, excellent. And, and one thing the chief said when I met with Phyllis Ellis, uh, Chief Manny Gomes and I met with Phyllis Ellis, president of the Brockton area chapter of the NAACP and vice chair Bishop Tony Branch. And um, we've had conversations with John Williams. We've had conversations with, of course, superintendent of schools, Mike Thomas and attorney Jackie Jones and Gwen Knowles and Ollie Spears. And there's a lot of people in Brockton uh, that have the same vision that we all have, right? Um, and we're all going to uh, work together to get to where we want to be. But I will say one thing about the chief. What you see is what you get. He's a man of his word, a man of honor. Um, that's why I appointed him proudly for three years, and we're going to continue to work that way to make sure that that change comes and Brockton truly can be an example. Chief, I just want to thank you again thank for what you, you do, and thank please you. pass on my sincere thanks to the men and women that protect and serve. I will. Um, we'll you. be back. We'll do these on a regular basis. Um, the first uh, television show I did called Our Brockton, I had Chief Gomes on and Chief Williams, uh, and we'll have more of those now that City Hall is open, um, and we're going to continue to wear the mandatory masks and social distance and wash your hands for no less than 20 seconds. But know this, um, I, uh, I took a knee for George Floyd, uh, and I, uh, I admonished uh, the murder of Mr. Floyd. Chief Gomes uh, did the same thing. He said it, and I don't know if everybody caught it, but he said it uh, at the prayer vigil. Uh, which was on June 1st uh, at outside of the amphitheater at, at um, City Hall. I uh, just wanted everybody to know that, listen, um, um, I'm your mayor, he's the police chief, uh, and it, Brockton is all of our city. So again, I want to thank you. I want to thank you, Chief, thank for what you. you do. I think this is very informative. We'll be back again, and have a great afternoon and a great evening, and be well and be safe.